Okay, that's emotional. That's There's good stuff. stuff. You ready to do this? Let's do it. Thinking Basketball Podcast. My name is Ben, and today it is time for the sixth annual Thinking Basketball Sub All Star Team. I c- Cody is back. We wrangled him from the clutches of fatherhood. He's a new man. Fred Van Fleet Heaters coming in the next hour from Mr. Hodeck, straight out of a basement in Wisconsin. That's not really a basement, but we won't tell anybody. The man, the myth, the legend. How you doing? Nor is it in Wisconsin right now. So the the time and the place, it's all I'm it's great, Ben. Being a dad is it's surreal. It's amazing. I find myself just staring at my daughter for, for long stretches of time. Like I'm usually like a very focused, like I need to get all these things done, but time just stops and I'm like, I just need to look at you and I can't stop I like looking this. at you. I like yeah. this side of you. Yeah. Uh, I'm a much this, I'm a much more mushy person, I think, now. Deeply connected to humanity at this moment. Yeah. That's Which is exactly. going to help with the sub all star team. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, I I did see there was a discussion on like a previous YouTube video where people are like, do we like sassy Cody or do we like like mean Cody and like mean Cody's better. So maybe mm. maybe I can wrangle him out a couple times here. But you know, I'm I'm mushy. You know, I'm going to give everyone the love and respect <laughs> that they deserve as a professional basketball player. Mm, okay, uh, you made a face because I I can't believe it either. This is the sixth sub all-star team that we've ever done if you don't know the drill the history behind this is basically we for you know as far as we can remember in nba history we've had an all-star team but that all-star team only covers the first kind of tier of top players the first wave of top players and as i started to get into historical basketball and the deep analysis and things like that years ago i noticed there's all these guys who probably never even make a single all-star team someone like lamar odom was a great inspiration for this podcast and Every year, those players are super, super relevant. They're super relevant on good teams. They're super relevant on championship teams. And so only making this official acknowledgement of like the top 25 or 26 all-stars in the league. There's 24 all-stars, but there's injury replacements. We have a couple this year on the official team as well. Um, It felt like it was missing something to me. So we do the next wave of players. Some people have called this the almost stars. Uh, As we go through, we'll always kind of talk about different use cases and archetypes of players and where they fall. But today, Cody, for the sixth annual sub all-star team, uh, historically, I take us out to about 50 players. If we have 25 to 30 all-stars, we'll have about 25 to 30 sub all-stars just to keep it nice and tidy and neat and fun like that. But today I realized like we've done so much work over the years talking about the ranges of players and things like that, that what we'll do is we'll rattle off guys who I think are are all-star players, basically. Uh, and then we'll get to the first fun area, which is like the range of players that could be all-stars, but also could be sub-all-stars. Mm-hmm. And because we're picking a team, we have to just draw an imaginary line in the sand and call it a day. And if the wind blew in another direction or if I was wearing, you know, black instead of blue, maybe we would go in a different place. But we're going we're gonna to put some of those guys on the all-star line, some of those guys on the sub-all-star line, I think there's another sort of group of players for me that I'm like, ah, I'm very comfortable with him being a sub all-star. And then there's the fringe guys where we're going to have to, like we do every year, take us out to, I don't know, 58, 62. Maybe last year we discussed 66 players and about half of them will be on the sub all-star team and half of them will be on the other side of the line. That's that's the plan for today. I think that's the the trickiest line to draw is the guys that just kind of miss the sub all-star cutoff because, you know, I, I get a list and I try to cut myself off around like 10 or so. But every time I look at the list of players, I'm like, this list is probably like 70 players long. Like there's a bunch of dudes that are like really close to being a sub all-star, but just aren't quite there. So at a certain point, like there's only so much you can do with just like making arguments for these guys, looking at the numbers, looking at the tape. Uh, so, you know, that's me saying that I feel like there's a good chance at some point you're going to say somebody and I'm going to make a reaction because I'll be like, I didn't even consider that guy. But you're absolutely right. It's just so hard to delineate between each of these segments. And uh, God dog it, Ben. We are going to be uh, doing our darndest to do that today. What is happening? Call target. Uh, you, you are the new father around these parts. You're invigorated. You're revitalized. You're more focused than ever. What position... Would you like to start out? We always do this by looking at smalls, wings, and bigs. What position would you like to start at? Smalls, 
Wings or bigs? Do you remember where we started last year? I do not. I could possibly... I feel like wings last year. I don't know. I don't remember. Okay. My first thought, because I think there's a lot of guys that I'm really interested in for this position. Uh, I think we should start with some bigs this year. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. That's what I have first listed in my little... Uh, what do I call this? My ballot? My sheet? Serendipitous, Ben. Yeah. Serendipitous. <laughs> this is fantastic. Okay. So... Bigs, let's let's rattle off the All Star Bigs. Let's start with that. Um, I have just, as we just said, I've got like probably more than twenty big men I can discuss. But let's start with the easy part. Let's start with the All Stars. Uh, Nikola Jokic, what? Joel Embiid, Giannis Antetokounmpo. I, Cody, I know you were nervous about what was going to happen <laughs> with Giannis. Uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Anthony Davis. Well, this is a fun one. Bam out of bio. And then it starts to get really fun. Um, and we reached the players that I would like to discuss for big men. Hmm. Yes, yes. So on the all-star side of the line, I would like to put... Uh, oh, I can't believe we're starting here. Yes, I would like to put Victor Wembanyama yes, you as would, an all-star. Ben. Yes, you would. Yes, yes, I would. I would like to uh, put him here. I've seen enough. Um, now, as I as I said last week with Kyle Mann, I don't have a huge problem with him not being on the all-star team because he's a rookie and his first couple months weren't as good as his last month or six weeks or whatever. But as a reminder, the way I do this is I'm not just beholden to the results of the first half of the season. I'm thinking about how you perform in a playoff setting. I'm thinking about how I would think of your sort of overall quality as a player in the league in 2024, which means we are not just saying, hey, you're a good regular season player. We can get us 45 wins on a decent team. Uh, I'm really thinking about the playoffs start tomorrow and we've got a tournament to go into. Victor Wembanyama is a rookie, so we've seen like some areas where it's been a little bumpy. We've seen other areas where he's been fantastic. I, I think the ship has sailed. I do not think we'll be looking back at, at like, hey, is Victor Wembanyama the 43rd best player? I think he's too good. I think he's too good. I'm going all-star Victor Wembanyama. You have a video about him. Uh, J. Kyle Mann has a video about him. You and Kyle had a, an hour and a half podcast Wasn't last long week enough. about him. Too short. I, 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 that's just me saying that I don't need to add anything to it. I didn't even finish the podcast. I'm about 45 minutes into it. I hope you reference the fact that he already might be the best lob finisher ever. Like it's it's unbelievable what he's able to do out there. Uh, he's he's maybe my favorite watch right now in the league, and I I don't know if that matters in terms of all star, but that's all I'll say about him right now. What we what we didn't even mention is that uh, some someone was like you know Wemby's cooled off a little bit, and I think that's true statistically. He had cooled off in the last couple of weeks, and I was like actually I checked it, and he's down to thirty points per seventy five on sixty percent true shooting. What a slouch! He's <laughs> he's really struggling. This rookie just thirty points. Uh, the, the of course he only plays like twenty eight minutes a game because of whatever kind of tomfoolery is going on down in San Antonio. They should make like a thirty for thirty documentary on whatever is happening down in San Antonio. This all of the beats of the season from the second they won the lottery to where they are now. I don't I don't know where that ship is going, but I know that if I stack up thirty NBA players and we have a playoff series coming up, I don't think there's going to be thirty I could name over Victor Wembanyama. He is an All Star, Chet Holmgren All Star. Mm-hmm. Oh, ooh, okay, good. That's. I think that was actually probably a common thought before the Wemby explosion. I think if you had asked people two months ago, people would be like, oh, Chet's the all-star rookie. And and Wemby is probably just like on the outside looking in. Obviously, he's had quite an explosion these last couple of months. But Chet kind of came out the uh, gates on fire, and he sort of hasn't let up. Like, I think maybe the shooting percentages themselves have gone down, but the rim protection is real. He's added. It feels like the, the driving game has developed more than anything offensively for him throughout the season. And, of course, he is just a great spacer for them. So... No issue with that at all. Chet Holmgren is 11th in the NBA in EPM, Cody. He's 15th in our Box Plus Minus model on uh, thinkingbasketball.net for our Patreon subscribers, patreon.com slash thinkingbasketball, if you're interested in playing around with that. And then we have an augmented Plus Minus, which was another kind of like hybrid. I'm not going to say it's like a old PIPM, but it's the same family of blending uh, Plus Minus and blending Box Score. He's in the top 40 in the league in that you're in if you're in the top 20 and the top 40 in the league and all those stats like basically what they're saying is 
you look like one of the best players in the NBA. And I have a hard time arguing with that. And we talk a lot about the rookie tax, but as I've said before, I think I think Chet has what Billy Raftery would call the onions. I think Chet is uh, is good to go in the playoffs. I'm very excited. First time, there may be some bumps and bruises, but I, I think he's a gamer. Um, I think he can rise to the competition. We might have a you know, a bumpy game in game one, but let's come back in game two. So I, I don't have too big of a rookie tax. I, I do have him on the like, is he a sub all-star or an all-star? But I'm, I'm going to go all-star. The thing that I'm really interested to see for him when he gets to the playoffs is the first time a team's like, we are going to make you shoot 12 three-pointers a game. And I see, want to see how he's going to respond to it. Because I feel like there's been a little bit of a time here where he puts the ball on the deck where I'm like, why don't you just take that shot? You are wide open. And I'm, I'm very interested in sort of like the Al Horford kind of way. I feel like I've seen Al Horford in that situation where it's like, you're going to take 10 threes this game. Like if you want to take this open shot, that's what we're going to do. And I want to see rookie Chet handle that sort of situation in the playoffs. To me, that's the most interesting storyline going to any run that the Thunder have. Okay, now it's starting to get really tricky for me um, in terms of where to put players. I had I had a couple more tough calls. Mm-hmm. Um Let's start in Boston with Chris Tepp's Porzingis. Yes. I think I went back and forth 15 different times mm-hmm. with Chris Tepp's Porzingis. And my, my big question in my head is like, how good is he actually as a rim protector? You know how on YouTube everyone likes to add actually to every, you know, how, how good is he actually? I don't know what we were going to, if we took out the word actually, I don't know what it was going to mean. But that's how I kind of feel about Chris Tepp's. I'm like, how much value does he have? as a rim protector because he's looked great physically. He moves really well. Um, He can, you know, he's hyper efficient. He's hyper efficient. I have an upcoming podcast. It's available for Patreon subscribers right now, but I think we're going to push it to the public once that's done um, about overall scoring efficiency and breaking in turnovers and baking in offensive rebounds on your own misses and things like that. Porzingis looks like one of the most efficient players in the entire league. Uh, I think he's been huge, huge, huge to the Celtics' success on both ends. I like the versatility he gives you. And to me, he's not just a like pick and pop and drop big man guy. He can move without the ball. He can take advantage of mismatches. His cutting and the way he's just moving physically looks beautiful. So I'm going to – I went back and forth. I'm going to say all-star this year for Chris Depps. I'm going to go all-star. Yeah, he's on that side of the line for me. He's also one of the few guys that I have highlighted in purple – which just means that I would really like to talk about him. So I'm glad that you yeah. landed on him because I think I feel the same way about him. I sort of deep dive the defense when he played for the Mavericks, uh, however many years ago that was at this point. I guess it was only like two years. I don't even know. Time is a flat circle. Uh, but the point with Porzingis is I think in terms of like rim deterrence, he's long. He's very athletic, like he can get pretty high pretty quickly. So I think he deters people from the rim pretty well. He makes people adjust their shot quite a bit. He blocks shots. And so I think in terms of some of those numbers, he looks really good. But like the physicality, I think maybe he doesn't bring like the... I don't want to like use a trope and say he doesn't bring like that sort of toughness, but he shies away from some of the like bumping and bruising that goes on in the paint. And I think that holds him back from being like one of the best rim protectors in the game. But in terms of like using the length to disrupt shots and stuff like that, uh, I think he's he's right near the top of the rim with of uh, the the league with that. The offense, too, like you said, is really interesting because I see some teams will try and put a smaller player on him and be like, you know what? No matter what, Chris Tapps is going to get a three-point shot off. Like, it doesn't matter if we have a big guy on him. Nobody can contest it, so we might as well put somebody small on him. But he can take him into the post, and he has a nice little turnaround bank shot that he calls on quite a bit, and players just sort of can't do anything about that uh, when they're in the post. So I just think it's a really dynamic offensive player that can be used in a bunch of different situations when he's surrounded by the cast that the Celtics have. And defensively, I think, you know, like I said, he's got some of these strong rim protecting indicators that will serve him well in the playoffs. Cody, um, do you know who has the best on off differential in the league? Meaning the, the difference in their team's performance when they are on the court versus off the court. Do you know, do you want to take a guess at who that is? Is it not Nikola Jokic? It is Nikola Jokic. The Nuggets are 21 points per 100 better. (laughs) Now, the question I would like to ask you, since you aced that first one, who is the second best on-off differential player in the NBA in 2024? Jokic is plus 21. Who is second? 
Man, I think it's I think it's either one of the Celtics or one of the I think it, the answer is probably going to be Porzingis. Uh, but I also kind of thought it was like you know Contavious Caldwell Pope. So I'm going to say KCP. I like where your brain is going, uh, but what you didn't realize is I'm setting up the next player oh. we're going to talk about. The answer is Lowry Marketing plus He's twenty second on off differential. And last season, he was in the 99th percentile at plus 17. He kind of, I think last year we talked about him and I was, I had him on this bubble as well. And I had him in the sub all-star category. I still would like to see, I think if we're talking about Lowry as like a solid, legit superstar, like I don't have to worry about him as a top 20 all-star kind of player. Um, I need just a half, I need him to be able to dial it up a half gear more in terms of taking the ball and and forcing offense like self-generating offense i just need a little bit more assertion because sometimes in jazz games the the offense can get away from them for spells they've actually they've been very good offensively for a while and they're they're a very competitive team colin sexton's played well but the, he just doesn't quite have that like well we need a bucket let's have a go-to move or get something. It's so much off ball. It's so much screening, switching, moving, cutting. And I think that's enough, but it's like a seven foot Clay Thompson. And I just want just a little, I just want a little extra from Lowry to push him in. But we were talking about length and Porzingis' length. Um, I think in many ways, Markkanen is a negative defender, but he uses his length really well. He actually gives you some versatility there where it's like he's not the greatest drop defender, but he'll rotate. He'll be in position. Um, that actually means you can play certain lineups where he protects the rim well enough. So I don't want to get too stuck on some of these fringe guys. But this year, Cody, I've seen enough. I'm going to if I have to pick a team, I'm going to put Lowry on the team. We are uh, perfectly aligned so far. Oh, Everyone that you said is on my all star team. Oh, my goodness. Um, I think this might be our first deviation. Yeah. I'm going to go to a player now who I have on my sub all-star team as a big man. And I believe I've had him, I've had him on the all-star team multiple times. I'm looking at the official thinking basketball uh, sub all-star history here. Yes, I have him as a four-time all-star. And this is the second year in a row I have him in the sub all-star range. And we can talk about why, but I'm going as the first sub all-star big man. I'm going with Rudy Gobert. He's a sub all star. Oh Denver. my goodness! A, I thought well, you, I, I, I thought you were going to go all star with him. Let me, let me ask you something because he's actually another purple guy that I want to be talking about here. Are you done with your all star bigs? Do you have no more all star bigs? Do you want me to reveal that as a as a kind of spoiler? Okay, I just, I just didn't know if I. Sh- I you can, I can tell you how many left, how many are left if you'd no, like. No, don't, don't tell me that. Let's talk about Rudy Gobert okay, for a second. Okay. Let's talk about Rudy Gobert. Yeah. Well, the short of it is, is, is playoff offense. I think his playoff offense is a is a massive negative. And um, I think his playoff defense as a rim protector and drop big is fantastic. It's not as earth shattering as what he can do moving the needle in the regular season, but I think it's fantastic. But I think that combination of being such an issue on offense, uh, not being able to take advantage of small ball, not being able to exploit mismatches. He's again, going back to this podcast that's coming out that I've done for Patreons. He's very turnover prone, um, all that kind of makes it hard for me to, in, in 2024 basketball, get him in that like, hey, Rudy Gobert is a top 25 player. Let me ask you something about Rudy Gobert. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, yes, go ahead. So here's, here's where I am with someone like Rudy Gobert. And this is relevant for a couple of other guys that, you know, some guys that aren't necessarily going to come up, but I think some guys that will come up, we can carry this conversation over to that. How much value offensively do you actually bring to the table when you're a high efficiency, somewhat low scoring guy that is uh, excellent in like the pick and roll and can grab some offensive rebounds and score. Like realistically, how valuable are you on offense? How much are you moving the needle for your team? Well, if you can only be a lob threat, um, then I think the first thing that's interesting is you really need to play with a pick and roll guy. Mm -hmm. who can hook you like that's the offense you can't go space or things like that and that's what the Timberwolves run into they have these tricky things where if you're not using him in pick and roll what does he do the second thing is you get to the playoffs or you get to different situations um mostly in the postseason I I shouldn't say it's regular season where teams will say hey you know how we answer this we just switch it now you don't get that lob anymore this is what teams did to 
uh, James Harden and, and Clint Capella for the Rockets, they switched it a ton. And that's when the Rockets started playing more isolation with Harden. You switch it to take away that downhill advantage. If you can exploit the smaller player in a mismatch, that's still pretty good. But in Gobert's case, he he can't, as far as I've seen statistically. It's actually just not a good situation. You don't want to force the ball into him uh, in that spot. So, and then the last part is the offensive rebounding. Um, offensive rebounding in that situation, independent of playing the pick and roll game, because when you play the pick and roll game, if two guys go to the shooter and you get the offensive rebound, that's part of the pick and roll to me. That, that's cleanup duty. I don't know if I would think of him as like, hey, when you when you get Rudy Gobert in the dunker spot and other guys play over on the weak side, you're getting Mitchell Robinson offensive rebounding situation. So I, I get where you're coming from, but my, my answer these days is not too much. That's kind of my answer. Yeah. So th- then I think Gobert has to be the gold standard of how high can you peak as a player if you're not moving the needle on offense and you're like, all defense sort of impact guy because as far as I'm concerned Rudy Gobert right now in the regular season is probably the most impactful defensive player in the league for my money from what we've seen so far and if he can't even make all-star level then it seems like you can't right now at least no player that we've seen in the league right now Victor Wembanyama, uh you know notwithstanding in the last next couple of seasons but you can't be an all-star level player if you don't move the needle at all on offense. Do you think that's accurate right Well, now? I think he's giving something back. I mean, I think that's the tricky part. Yeah, mm. I think there are I think there are other guys like I'm I'm not sure as we move forward how someone like a Derek Lively will mm. shake out and compare. They may be a little better in a playoff setting. Um, you know, Bam certainly expanded his offensive game in the last few years, but you think about this like offensive rebounding athletic rim runner. Bam can pass. So there's the passing component as well. I know I know Gobert can pass a little bit, but again, I think like the yeah exactly. If you're not on YouTube, Cody made sort of like a scrunchy like I don't know. That's how I feel about it. But I think the more important takeaway is that are you running delay sort of handoff sets through him at the top of the key and the elbow? Is he dynamic enough to um, threaten your defense so you have to hug up on him so he can hit a backdoor cutter? To me, the answer is no. And if the answer is yes for certain players, then I think, Cody, you get into a situation where it's like, okay, this guy could be an all-star without being a great offensive player, mostly because of his defense. I think in Colbert's case, he's giving something back. Okay, and I'm glad you mentioned Lively because I've been, I've been into this rim-running sort of uh, archetype for a little bit because I'm like, how valuable can you actually be offensively with this? And I was looking at some odd-off numbers. I'm like, all right, what, is, what does Lively look with and without Luka? What does Clint Capella look like with and without Trey? And both of them, I mean, they have their points per 75 drop off a couple. Uh, their efficiency drops off like six percentage points in relative true shooting percentage. So there's this kind of contextual thing where it's almost like I think you – can give a little bit more on offense like you said if you're next to somebody that's going to uh you know drag out every inch of your value on offense like somebody like Luca would with Gobert uh but I think contextually in like the Timberwolves right now for what Gobert's around he's probably a net negative like you said offensively and um yeah I think overall that's why he ends up in the sub all-star category too for me Let's let's do another tricky one um, because we are we are on pace for the longest podcast in NBA history right now. Uh, I just want to fo- we have a couple to blast through, but I want to focus on these interesting case studies. I have this next player as a two time All Star in the past. I had him as a sub All Star when he was younger. It's very tricky to figure out what to do with him mm-hmm. because I don't know about granting him grace and leeway because of his, his physical makeup. But Zion Williamson mm-hmm. is another one of these players hugging the line for me, obviously coming in, not in great condition. He's played better. I've seen some signs, Cody, but we still got to go through the all-star break the rest of the season. Is he going to get in better shape? Is he going to get in worse shape? Um, I'm not sure what to make of it. I'm going to go sub all-star with Zion Williamson. Oh, you're going sub all. This is actually our first player where we differed because uh, I put him on the all-star side of things. Okay, okay. But I think I I agree with everything you said. Like, it's tricky with a guy that was, you know, drafted for the 2020 season and he hasn't played a single playoff game. Like, we don't know what he looks like in the playoffs, but you watch him play, like you said recently. The vertical pop isn't what we want to see. It's coming back. 
the finishing ability, it doesn't even matter. Like, his touch around the rim is just, there's nothing guys can do. He's just spinning do- through dudes. He's throwing, like, these beautiful soft touches high off the backboard and finishing them. Uh, he, he's just a wrecking ball, and I think he bends defenses in a really special way with his finishing ability. So, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm granting him a little bit too much in the way that he can bend the defenses, but I still think it's a it's an extraordinarily valuable skill once we enter the playoffs. Yeah, I think, I think if he has had more of a pedigree, more of a history of this, I could I could give him sort of a grace period and say like, all right, I, I, I kind of know what I expect rounding into form in the playoffs, but I just don't have that confidence to say at this point, which means if we came back and did this in eight weeks, I might say, yeah, I mean, Zion had an all-star season, no doubt. But I also might come back and say like, ah, I don't know, Zion, Zion clearly did not look like a top 25 or 30 player this season. So I'm going to drop him on the sub all-star side of the line. Now, there is a player, and this will actually come up with multiple players, but there's another player who I think is right in this range uh, who I've seen play in the postseason and I've seen struggle in the postseason. And his strengths and weaknesses and studying them a ton in in depth last year really made me come out of the playoffs and go like, okay, I, I I have a very good feel for what you are as a regular season player and I think what you are as a playoff player. So I'm going to go sub all-star with Demonis Sabonis. Oh, you put him down to... I struggled with him a lot. I struggled with him because he's just so good in the regular season. Yes. Right? Efficiency's yes. He, up there. To me, yeah. he's an all-star regular season player. But yeah, I can't get some of those Kavon and Looney matchups from, <laughs> from the playoffs out of my mind. So I, I don't know. I'm being honest here. Like I, I did end up putting him in the all-star category because I'm like new year, new me kind of thing. Let's just shake off what happened in the past. Uh I don't know. I'm probably granting people a little, like I said, mushy attitude right now. I'm like, you know what? I like what Zion and Sabonis look like right now. Let's pretend that this is going to be able to carry on into the playoffs. He was in the ninth percentile in our turnover tracking and all of our playoff series, playoff database that we uh, have on thinkingbasketball.net. Average 17 points on negative 6% true shooting in that series. It was a real struggle. The Kings were way better with him on the bench in that series, his overall impact numbers were in the basement. Um, and like I said, you know, if you, if you took that at face value, you would say he's not even a sub all star. So it's only one series, and he has, as you said, he's playing the Warriors, he's playing Kavon Looney. Uh, but to me, it just showed like, okay, the playoffs, the differences between the playoffs and the regular season are a thing that's specifically going to affect the rhythm. And the kind of surgical cadence of Sabonis' game, the passes he likes to make, the handoff actions, and you just sag off him and you're like, please shoot jumpers. Um, We'll give you threes and we're going to try to take away some of the cuts and the cutting actions on your teammates. And all of a sudden, that means if he can't power through you, if he can't bully ball you, uh, and maybe there's some matchups where he can do that. I don't think you're going to get nearly the same value you get in the regular season. So I think in some playoff series, he'll have some success. In other playoff series, I think we'll continue to see those kinds of struggles. Puts him right in the purple zone, as Cody likes to say. So uh, I'm going sub-all-star there. You have more thoughts, yes. I'm just I'm interested in Sabonis because last year, according to the ThinkBasketball.net database, shot 49% on mid-range jumpers or mid-range field goal attempts. This season, 50% once again. This is a guy that should have like a solid mid-range game. And I can like I'm vis- envisioning multiple plays from the playoffs where he's just left open from 16 feet, refusing to take it. And uh, I, I find that strange based on how he's been able to shoot the last couple seasons. So I don't know if there was a weird season la- uh, series last year. I don't know if like the ghost of Moses Malone taking over Kevin Looney's body, like just completely threw him out of his game. Uh, but I don't know. I'm, I'm expecting more this playoffs from Sabonis. So I have nine big men in this purple zone in this ra- Like their high end range could make them an all star. Their lower end range uh, or their median range drops them just below the line. For me, uh, that's a lot. That's a lot of them. We've mentioned Rudy Gobert. We've mentioned Sabonis. We've mentioned Zion. We did Chris Stapps and Lowry Markkinen. Uh, Pascal Siakam is another one in this range. I, I, Cody, I kind of miss the I kind of miss the defense and cutting days of Pascal Siakam. We, we're now like ISO score pull up three Pascal Siakam with with a lot less defensive punch. Uh, I kind of continue to feel 
I, I think I felt this way for a few years. He he toes this line. Last season, I has him as a, had a, had him as a sub all star for the third time in our history. I will put him as a sub all star as well. Have you watched many of the uh, the Pacers games with him? Have you just been able a to couple, catch him just a smatter. I'm really I'm really waiting to get going on the Halliburton Pascal duo tag team championship belt situation, and you know see see how they do. See, so, yeah, I've checked in just a little. Yeah, just based on how Siakam's played, uh, I'm really interested to see how they they pair together. Because like you said, a lot of ISO stuff, a lot of stuff in the post. I don't know if anyone is as vocal, screaming his way to the basket (laughs) as Siakam is. It's very clear listening to him on League Pass. But uh, I kind of feel what you're saying. Like, I I do miss the, like, third option offensive guy that's also maybe the best defender on that Raptors team for a period of time. And it just it doesn't feel like he has that sort of impact anymore. There's one more guy in that purple zone for me, and that is uh, Alperin Schengen. I'm not quite ready to go all-star. I really like sort of him as a uh, pseudo offensive centerpiece. I don't know the right word. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't. I don't think in 2024 say let's build an awesome offense completely around everything Alperin Schengen does. But if he's a hub of your offense, maybe much like Sabonis, I think you're going to have a really good offense. And he's taken strides defensively to tread water and use his length and physicality. And how much is that going to hold up in the playoffs? I don't know. But uh, to me, Alpern Schengen, another sub all-star big man. Look at all these big men. Code. I mean, we could fill up the entire all-star team with big men. I know. This is incredible. This is incredible. And yeah, Shangun is just a guy. I think he's going to have the same, even worse scoring warts as, as Sabonis uh, once the playoffs start. So that kind of bumped him down for me here. Okay. Somehow now we only get to the very, very tricky, difficult conversations of um, who's, who's going to make the sub all-star team and who's going to be on the other side of the line. Uh, I will go. Oh, this is This is so fun. This is really, really fun. Four, four, I have, I have two more. Well, I don't have two. I have four more sub all star. I have four more sub all star big men. Okay, I will say that. Um, I'll, let's set aside this category. I have a category of players, Cody, that I don't know how to describe it. I don't want to be too pejorative, mm-hmm. but you can't trust. You can't trust them psychologically you can't trust them you can't rely on them you can't rely on them to be there for the team all the time you know what i'm saying they might get suspended they might get kicked out of the game they might get benched they might get they might tweet something you know what i'm talking about i feel like there's a there's, there's actually a couple of guys you could be yes. you could be talking yes. about here i want to know which all, one you're talking about but you know what i'm saying the dennis rodman kind of like you know i can evaluate you as a player but then i also have to somehow make a mental calculation for whether you're going to even be in the game that kind but, of thing like you're going to make some brilliant passes out there, but also defensively you're going to be able to read everybody's mind and just hold yeah. everything together from your brilliance. Yes, but then also you might fall apart and get suspended for a long time. You might that kick LeBron thing. James in the in the crotch. You, <laughs> uh, I that's Draymond Green. That is Draymond Green. Uh, I I feel that way about Carl Anthony Towns. Yes, you do. Uh, the man who scored 62 points and got benched for lo- <laughs> lunatic shot selection, which was one of my favorite games of the year. That was an all-timer. That game was incredible. I accidentally started watching that game twice the other day and didn't even realize. I was So much was going on in that game. I was like scouting something else. I was like, wait, this is the Carl Anthony Towns 62-point game. Um, I think it was the Hornets. I was scouting something going on with the Hornets. It, oh, that I'm was sorry. just spectacular. Hey, free, <laughs> we're going to get to freeing LaMelo Ball okay. later in the show. <laughs> Uh, you know who else fits in this category, Cody? He's not a big man, but we just got to cover this ground now so we can skip it later. Kyrie Ooh. Irving fits in this category. He does. Right? He's like, as a basketball player on the court, you are ahead of where you are when you take into account like what is going to be happening with Kyrie Irving in the locker room, out off the, off the court. So I don't know what, I don't really know what to do too much with any of these players. Um, I'm just going to say... For Towns and Green, they're going to go on the sub All Star team. That's what I'm okay. going to say. Yeah, yeah. they're they're both yeah. on it for me as yeah. well. I think. Okay, great. Well, continue. Is it because <laughs> some of the, the playoff struggles and the aforementioned conversation that Towns is not a straight up All Star for you? Yes, yes. Okay. Because okay. okay, it very much is an on court thing with Towns in the sense that the moments where he gets frustrated or distracted or just that the, that that little like break from the focus is something that I think causes real problems 
both on offense a little bit. He's so talented on offense, but especially on defense. And then he starts getting into foul trouble, and then he's re- and then he's reaching, and he's late, and he's second guessing. And in big moments against guys that will put your feet to the fire, that will say hello, hello Sabonis. Um, let's see what happened to Sabonis last year. He got stepped on in one game, and then Looney just trucked him like out of. He's like, okay, I'm gonna play. I'm gonna Moses Malone right now. <laughs> I'm gonna play the whole game, and I'm gonna truck you. And also, I'm gonna get in your head and like sag off you while you're at the free throw line. You're gonna have to make that shot. This is what happens in the playoffs when the games get really intense. And there's a lot of situations where get regular season games have been intense with Towns, and I feel like it's chipped away at his on court value. It's led to mistakes, and so. As a player in a vacuum in the second quarter of a regular season game, I would have him as an all-star. I think he is extra- extraordinarily talented. We've talked about his drive, face-up, uh, incredible outside shooting, and he's a good passer as a big man. But he really should be playing the five. You move him over to the four you know, defensively to help out. He's been better this year. So again, I think on the court in the regular season, you could say he's an all-star, but that's where it factors in for me. I I think it bleeds away at his actual value in big situations. I think a good sign for the frustration level is when he kind of like cups the ball like this and he throws like a softball pass and you think it's just a little too fast. That's when it's off the rails. That's when you're like, oh no, this, this is not a good headspace right now. That's usually my indicator when I'm watching Minnesota play. I'm, I'm going to have Jared Allen as a sub all star. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? I, yeah. I considered him for like a hot second for, for the actual All-Star team. Okay, okay. This is my second straight year with Jared Allen as a sub-All-Star. I love his floater game. I like uh, a little extra passing. He's got the solid drop big man thing. Um, I actually think in many ways you could argue he's he's been well ahead of Rudy Gobert as a playoff offensive player, mm. given what we've seen from him this season. So Jared Allen, sub-All-Star. I have I have one more. I have one more sub all star. Is it? Is it? Is it Jaron Jackson Jr.? It's Jaron Jackson Jr. <laughs> you, you're using dad power. You're not allowed to do this. <laughs> We're only in the first category. Jaron Jackson Jr. Now, now, would I say in the first half of this season with some of the struggles that Memphis has had and the position he's in, being overtaxed, he really needs to be your third or fourth offensive guy trying to do more offensively. Would I say he's had a top forty or top fifty? Uh, record or results in the first half of the season? No, I would not. But I still believe in the overall defensive package as a secondary attacker on offense. He is a player who, if you switch, will bully ball you a little in the post, has the hook with both hands, can get to the free throw line. Some of my concerns, uh, I'm not as high on him defensively as I was in the past because I think some of the fouling and body control stuff does separate him from the very best of the best. But I I went back and forth and really struggled, and I think he's just too good, and he's had too good of a track record to not be in this whatever it comes out to be, like top 55 players uh, in the season based on, you, you know, again, you check in on some Memphis games lately, and you still see some of those same things there. It's just I think the situation is overtaxing him. Yeah, and like you said, the overtaxing of it all, he's not a great passer, but he's put in a position a lot of times where he sort of has to make some of these passes. I see some high-low passes actually once in a while where I'm thinking, okay, Jaron's able to to make this pass once in a while, but there's other times where I'm like, I don't want you trying to make these passes, but I just don't know what else the Grizzlies are supposed to do at this point. And so I think he's one of a couple of other guys that I think because of their particular role – They're not showcasing just how good they would be if they were actually maximized this year. And so I still I'm reserving the right to be like Jaron Jackson Jr. might be like an all star level player. But I think based on the role and everything we're seeing on the team context right now, I'm more comfortable with him being a sub all star. I have four more players on my cut line who I put on the other side of the cut line. I think you can probably make a high end argument or like, hey, there's uncertainty. They're young. Uh, kind of argument about them being sub all-stars. I'm going to read those four names to you, Cody. And then if you want to talk about them, we can talk about them. Otherwise, we can go to the next category. Those four names are Evan Mobley, uh, Julius Randle, Paolo Boncaro, and your guy, Brooke Lopez. Oh, Brooke Lopez. I actually wasn't expecting that name. Brooke has actually played pretty well this season. If you look Mm -hmm. at the uh, numbers, and again, if you buy his rim protection, he's a similar archetype to some of the other big men that we've already gone into detail on. Yeah, I just, 
I don't think Brooks quite as good as he has been in the past. So if you have thought of him like a couple of years ago as being a sub all star and you think he's regressed a little bit, maybe he's on the outside looking in, just like you're kind of saying here. Um, I don't even want to talk about Evan Mobley. That's just kind of it. Just kind of hurts. It hurts a little too much. Brooke, by the way, three times sub all star in the history of this podcast. So that's exactly uh, what it is for me. But just want to acknowledge him here. Okay. Oh, the bigs. Whew, there were a lot of a lot of conversations to have on the bigs. Let's go to let's go to guards. Does that work? Podcast isn't over. That wasn't <laughs> that wasn't the full episode. That was the first segment. That was, <laughs> that was, a, that was the first segment. We only have two more of those. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> so let's look at guards. I'm just gonna rattle off a lot of slam dunk all stars for me. Is that, how's that oh, sound? Perfect. Uh, Shea Gilgis Alexander, Tyrese Halliburton. Luka Doncic, Donovan Mitchell. Oh my goodness, what is going on with him? James Harden, Jalen Brunson, Tyrese Maxey, Jamal Murray, Damian Lillard, Stephen Curry, and Trey Young. Those are guys that, to me, I don't have to think too hard about. They are on the all-star side of the equation. Anyone there we need to discuss? Uh, No, I don't think so. I think they're all pretty clear to me. Jamal Murray, by the way, the fact that he didn't make the all-star team is amazing because he is so much better than the second best player in NBA history to not make the all-star team. Cody, can he keep this run up and be like a first ballot Hall of Fame? If the Nuggets win three titles and he never makes the all-star team, we were just looking at his Western Conference Finals performance last year where he averaged like 30-something points a game on massive efficiency, completely dominated the Los Angeles Lakers, had an argument to win Western Conference Finals MVP over Nikola Jokic, and he's never made an all-star team. But that's kind of how I feel with like Mike Conley getting his first all-star appearance, his only all-star appearance in 2021 when he was with Utah. Like I think there was a time like around 2017, 2016 where the the shooting stroke for Conley came together. He was still a feisty little defensive player where I think he was very clearly like an all-star level player and he would have been in that I think Jamal Murray is better than what Mike Conley was at his peak uh but yeah if we if Mike Conley's now out of the picture like Murray is very clearly like steps above anyone else that hasn't been an all-star okay let's go to the purple zone um we already mentioned Kyrie Irving I'm going to do the same thing with Kyrie Irving that I did with the other guys I'm going to put him as a sub all-star I think a lot of Kyrie Irving's on-court performance and indicators this year have been really good he's he's insanely skilled uh he's a ridiculously good shooter he adds that on ball pop but i i just you know uh, obviously defensive concerns and the other stuff i'll I'll just go with sub all-star with Kyrie irving let's talk about Derek white he's another guy in this zone for me Derek white just does so many things well he's like he's like that classic like i'm a brown belt in a lot of things but I don't know if that's enough to get him in the like top 25. I don't know if he has, is there an area he's a black belt? Is there an area that really pushes the value up? As I say this, I think very, very highly of Derek White. He's in this purple zone, but I'm going sub all-star. And he feels like kind of a, a quintessential, hardcore, solid sub all-star. I mean, in terms of like the black belt part of it, if you recall back into our, our best defensive players of the last yes, 15 the, years. Yes, the shot blocking, yes. He was, uh, I think I had him sixth overall yeah. in terms of guards. So I I think very highly of his defense. I think very highly of his length and his ability to bother by the rim and things like that. I'm, I'm going to be vulnerable with you right now, Ben. Um, I don't really know what to do with the Celtics, just in general. Like, I don't know what to do with any of these guys. Because when you look at somebody like Derek White, whatever you think of his defense, how much value are you actually bringing to the table offensively when you're sort of this like low to medium low load kind of guy, right? Like if you're not a Steph Curry level shooter and you don't have like that kind of crazy gravity, you're a good passer. You're not like Draymond Green level passer with that sort of low load. Um, You can shoot the ball and you can drive, but you're not doing it like super high volumes. How much are you actually moving the needle offensively? And when I was kind of factoring in all of that stuff, I'm like, at the end of the day, like, that's just not moving the needle as much as somebody that has a much higher load than you do and is doing it like with high efficiency and passing the ball a lot better and things like that. So just by nature of how much he's literally doing on the court, I kind of stuck him in the sub all-star category. I appreciate the push for him to make the all-star team based on the results of the Celtics, based on how he's played in the first half of the season, based on his importance 
that chemistry, that balance in the ingredients that have them playing so well. Uh, but to me, it's just not not quite good enough. Um, boy, this is so different than the bigs. Looking at my my little list here, uh, CJ McCollum. Have you seen him play lately? He is playing fantastically. Only thing I'm looking at. Yeah, he's literally in my sub all star category. I was I was watching him a little bit, and I'm like, I'm not giving this guy enough credit. I think the the defensive Ooh. woes take it out of it. But when he's given the chance to create, like he's pretty solid at getting into the paint. He can fling some passes around and and the shooting. He's just kind of besides like getting into the paint and being a high level scorer there. He's pretty valuable shooting from pretty much anywhere on the court. His self generated scoring in moments for the Pelicans. His extremely high level shooting from the outside. Uh, I think it's been really key for them. I think he's playing some of the best basketball of his career. Obviously, this type of guard, we're talking about guards. You are a kind of very good shooter, borderline microwavey scorer who gives something back defensively. I don't think that archetype gets you up into the star, superstar category. Uh, But CJ's playing really well especially in the last month. I'll try to pull it up in a second if I can. We talked about him last year as sort of being fringy in this category and not quite making it, but I've had him as a sub all star before, and I think he's playing some of the best basketball he's played in a long time, even though he's like 33 at this point. So CJ is a is a sub all star for me. Um, how do you feel about Darren Fox? Uh, I have him in the, uh, the sub all star category. Okay. Darren Fox to me is another one of these purple players. And I actually, I'll go the other way with the Kings on what I said about Sabonis. I like some of the toughness I saw from Darren Fox in the postseason. I think the fact that he's so quick and can play with so much pace does translate to stressing defenses in the postseason because of that athletic advantage. And I think even defensively, where we talk about these small guards having issues defensively, I think some of his physical attributes in big moments or in certain matchups can actually, oh, you made a steal, you made a big play, you made a, you had a big uh, isolation stand defensively. So I'm going to go Fox on the all-star side of the line. He's going to be mm-hmm. my last all-star guard uh, in this category, and then I have a few more sub-all-star guards. I do like his defense. I think when you look at some of the other guards that are sort of like Fox, I like Fox's defense better than some of them, and maybe that's enough to bump it all up. Uh, but I don't know. I always wanted him. I thought he was always a notch lower in terms of his passing ability and a notch lower in terms of his scoring and efficiency compared to some of the other guards. So I was looking at the levers and I'm like, I I ultimately don't know how much is his defense actually moving the needle in the playoffs. So landed at sub all-star for me. He's, he's, you know, 16th in EPM estimated plus minus. Um, Mm -hmm. he's 32nd in our offensive box plus minus he's 33rd. Uh, in that other stat, augmented plus minus per game. So I, I do think the indicators have started to come along that he's certainly uh, in this range as a player. You know, we've I, I tagged him purple, as you said, but I think I'm going to go on the all-star side of the line for De'Aaron Fox. Now, we have, we have a very tricky one that's near and dear to your heart to discuss. You know what's coming. You know you know exactly what's coming. Uh, does, does he play for Milwaukee? He has played for Milwaukee oh, before in the past. Okay. Yeah. He's played for Milwaukee. He doesn't play for Milwaukee anymore. He plays for the Boston Celtics now. And um, he Yeah, uh, go yeah, go ahead. Let me let me just say, let me just say <laughs> that I think he's a very interesting case. I think Ben that Drew Holiday is a very interesting case because if we look at him last year, I think it was very clear that he was like an all-star level player last year. He was fantastic. He was fantastic the last couple of seasons with Milwaukee. But just by nature, again, the Derek White sort of argument of it, by nature of what he's given to do offensively, like he's, his load, his ability to, not ability, but his just, his, his role in creating for guys is so brought down that he's losing out on a lot of what made him so valuable for Milwaukee. And that was, you know, creating shots for, uh, for his teammates and things like that. The defense, maybe it slipped like a step maybe he doesn't look quite as quick as he had uh, in the last couple of seasons but I think the role offensively just kind of brings him to the point where I don't even know if he's in sub all-star right now Ben it's very tricky it's very very tricky uh I will say I have had Drew Holiday as a sub all-star 
a couple times. Actually, I, technically once. I had him as a sub all-star once in 2020 and then an all-star for the last three years. And I think he's a player who it took me a while to just appreciate how valuable all the little non-scoring stuff that he's doing was on the court, especially in a playoff series, d- defensive versatility, rebounding, cutting, passing, running offense when needed with the second unit, second side attacks. Uh, now, has he played like a top 50 player in Boston? Probably not. Am I concerned that he might be old and slightly cooked in the legs? And you're just a little bit older, age catches up to you, you play slower. I am. But also, this type of player, going back to Draymond Green, I mean, I feel like if you go back and listen to some of the old Sub All-Star podcasts, both Draymond Green and Chris Paul, probably other players, but those two veterans come to mind, four, five, six podcasts ago, 2019, 2020, they were players who people were saying, they're washed, they're over the hill, they're, they, you know, they've missed a couple games in the beginning of the season, they're not top 50 players anymore. And to me, when you are like that good at basketball, that's when I give you the grace period that like, okay... I'm a little more comfortable saying what's happening with Drew in Boston is that he's just sitting back and waiting to fill in the space needed to be filled in. And if Boston had less offense, he would provide more offense. If they needed more ball handling, he'd provide more ball handling. Um, You probably never get him to just automatically provide more shooting. That's not his thing. But my hunch is when you get to the playoffs and it comes down to brass tacks, am I going to want to have 50 or 55 players clearly above Drew Holiday, based on what I'm seeing this year? I don't think so. So I think, Cody, we're seeing sort of that. We've called it data collection before. It's not that he needs to collect data. It's just he's he's so patient and passive. He did the same thing when I covered him at UCLA. When I covered him at UCLA, he was touted as this massive prospect, didn't come in and score as much, defended, passed, played more within the system. And it's just like, 10, 15 years ago, I used to think, well, that makes him not quite that good. And I, I've been convinced now over many, many years of massive, massive data samples of just how good he is of like, no, that's actually how he figures out how to be really good. So I'm going to err on the side of sub for him. Okay. I, yeah. I, I Now I just feel bad. Like you're just here shaming me right now. The one time I go negative and I, you're, right, I, you're right. I'm glad you did this for me. Did you, did you go negative there? Yeah, I, I made him a not sub all star. I put him on the other side of that line this year. Oh, I just figured you were teasing me when you said that. No, just, I'm dead serious. I but let's let's go with what you said. I liked I everything. I figured that you there just was said. no way you were gonna you were gonna stick to that. Uh, where are we? Guards? How many guards do we have left? We have to talk about a couple more guys in the zone. A couple more guys in the zone. Let's talk about Lamelo Ball. I, we've talked about Lamelo Ball a ton. I'll make this super short. I think LaMelo Ball is awesome and he's in a terrible situation and he has great instincts and those instincts need a little coaching and need to be reined in and they aren't being reined in and it makes him not quite as efficient as he could be and he's injured and he's coming back from injury. I'm going to go sub all-star with LaMelo Ball. I think he's a really good basketball player. There you go. Perfect. Remember when I said I was going to realize that I didn't put a player down that I should have? Was that LaMelo Ball? That's LaMelo Ball. I never put him down, but you're absolutely right. Uh, There's a guy I want to bring up here that I think is really interesting. Let's do it. I've been driving this whole time. Let's, Cody, take the Uh, wheel. I'm really struggling with this dude because I really like him. I, I really like him. He's strong. He's a little T-Rex armed, but he moves around a lot off ball. He's physical. He's tough. He's the kind of guy I want in the playoffs, but the numbers are really weird, Ben, and I don't know what to do about Desmond Bain right now. Uh, I'm going to talk about Desmond Bain as a wing. Can I do that? He's a wing? He, he's listed at 6'5", and he plays most of his minutes at 2 or 3. I feel like he's more of a yeah. point guard type. Okay, well... I'll, I understand, we'll, yeah. Can we can we down. punt him? Can we punt him? Can I go to somebody else then? Yes, please. Because you uh, were confusing me so... I was so confused as to who you are talking about. How about Mr. Colin Sexton? Oh, wow. There's a player I didn't write down that absolutely goes in this bucket. Yeah, um, I think he's he's been a nice, efficient scorer this year. Uh, defensively, I think he's definitely giving some stuff back, but I think the creation's really nice. He's kind of driving the, the, the ship in terms of like the jazz needing to get into the paint and create some stuff. And, uh, I think it's time that we give Colin Sexton a little bit of his flowers for sort of taking the wheels when, you know, like you said, you want Laurie Markinen to kind of grab it and just go. Sexton does that for them, uh, at a good level. And I think he does it well. It's true. It's true. He's done a good job. 
He deserves to be mentioned here. I think in my head, I, I do give some of that credit to Will Hardy for putting him in a great situation. Like, he's really good in drives. You know, I think he's 11th in the league in drive frequency and is a top quartile in drive finishing percentage. And he can shoot from the outside. Do I love him running offense in a different system outside of Utah? I don't know. Uh, the last month with the Jazz, he's averaged 28 points per 75, plus 4% true shooting relative to the league. He has the ball a lot. They've been way better with him on the court, plus seven with him on the court. It's it's a it's a tough call. It's a tough call. I don't know. Okay. I like him. I have him in my sub all-star camp. Okay. I put him <sighs> on that end. You're going to really make me agonize later in the show. This always happens every year. Every year I have to go back and make a change on the fly. Um, remind me about Colin Sexton when we get to the end. Remind me about I'll, him. I'll do my best. What do you do with Fred Van Vliet? Put him on the other side of the not, I just said that terribly, not a sub all-star for me. Just on the okay. outside, though. Just on the outside. Is that because his sort of offensive centerpiece-ness is not potent enough for you? Yeah, I I don't know. I don't, he's not as good of a passer as some of these other guys. I think he's a solid, he's got some solid hands defensively, but I don't think he's really moving the needle that much defensively. Uh, the pull-up three game, I think, is the big thing that was brought up a, a few years ago, but he's still not like that efficient of a scorer. It's just, I, I, I want him to be a little bit better in pretty much every area to bump him up a bit more. Interesting. I think the thing about him that kind of contrasts with someone like Sexton uh, is Van Vliet is great at controlling tempo for the offense. So e even though you don't get like a potent kind of pick and roll, hey, we're going to run a ton of stuff through you and it's going to be amazing offense. He's a good pull-up three-point shooter and he won't necessarily do too much or eat up too much oxygen. So if you need certain possessions that are just like steady possessions, I think I think he gives you those. Uh, how valuable is that? Or, you know, how much does he move the needle defensively? <sighs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but uh, both of these guys are tricky. I'm looking at, uh, in terms of just like Houston, because, you know, we have Alper and Shangun, who's a sub all-star. You have Fred Van Fleet, who maybe it sounds like you might be dancing with him being a sub all-star. I am, yeah. It, it feels a little odd that you have these two guys and their offense is as underwater as it is. And when I see that kind of thing in my mind, I'm like, what am I missing here? Are there some other guys that are quite negative on offense? Like, should I be expecting a little bit more when these guys are out here? Maybe the on off stuff is proving me completely wrong. And when they're on the court, they actually look like Titans offensively. Uh, I, I don't know. So I guess like that number game makes me more nervous. Who was the other Fred Van Vliet? And who was the other one? Albert and Shangun. Sh oh, you think Shangun's offense is underwater? No, I, I'm saying that like if both of them are sub all-star level players and they're getting a good amount of their value from offense, I would like to see Houston's offense in general be better than it is. Mm. Well, I, to me, I'm considering, that's a great point, but I'm considering Ime Udoka as the coach, defensive talent around them, and a lot of youth. So what is happening? Um, maybe if we can go back in time, because there's a, there's a player that Shen Gun reminds me of a little bit functionally in terms of his effectiveness in my head. Is like, you take Louis Scola. Mm. Take Louis Scola for the Rockets and give him a guard, like give him uh, Aaron Brooks as his point guard <laughs> and then put three defensive players out there. Put Shane Battier and some other defensive players out there. Would you think really poorly of the offensive performance of someone like Scola if he couldn't take a, a more defensive-minded team and make them good offensively, especially with a defensive-minded coach? That's kind of where I'm coming from when I think of those guys. Man, maybe you're onto something there, but again, like when you even look at the the times when both of them are on the court together, you have Shangun and Fred Van Vliet on the court, their offense is barely, I don't even think it's quite a point better than league average, right? And I know everything that you just said and you brought up the point about Scola, but I don't know. Maybe you're right about that because it else is such a defensively slanted roster outside a lot of those guys. Um, but yeah, I, I would just like to see a little bit more of an offensive punch when they're both out there so I don't know I, I don't know why I'm making it hurt Fred Van Vliet a little bit more I don't know why I'm taking it out on him but I am and that's where he ended up in my book let's go to maybe the hardest player for me to place this season Bradley Beal of the Phoenix Suns did you forget Bradley Beal I did forget Bradley Beal well I completely forgot tell me about Bradley Beal 
Well, yeah. I mean, how do you think of Bradley Beal as a player? Do you do you think of him as just sort of like a a Joe Schmo, or don't you think of him as like a pretty pretty big impact offensive player? Well, in terms of Bradley Beal, what I've always liked about it, like I enjoyed watching him like in the past for the Wizards just because of how valuable he is moving off the ball. Like even when they didn't have a lot of offensive talent, he was still doing a great job of, you know, getting into those openings, getting he's really good at contorting his body to make some of these short mid-range types of jumpers. Like his legs are kind of splayed all over the place and he's making them. So, I mean, if that's the kind of Bradley Beal we're getting and he's next to guys like Devin Booker and Kevin Durant, I can see him squeezing in and getting some value that way. But also like those are two guys that are going to like to shoot a little bit more in isolation. So maybe he's not getting as much value, especially if he's not spacing the floor and shooting the three as well as, you know, Bradley Beal of old used to be. And defensively, I mean, we're talking about a guy that's historically been one of the worst defensive guards in the league. And so when you put that all together, I I don't know, maybe I didn't forget him, Ben. Well, he hasn't played well. I mean, that's that's part of what makes, makes this so tricky. We had him on the sub all-star team multiple times. In the past, I think last year he was injured and, and we did not consider him because he was injured. But he's certainly been a player who has been in this area as a player. Uh, maybe, you know, he's made an all star team um, or maybe multiple all star teams, things like that, based on the value of his offense. But you look at what's happening in Phoenix. A, the statistical profile has not been particularly good, which is why you probably left him out of your mind for this whole conversation. But he also is. It's a little bit like Kyrie Irving. Like he is more talented than most of these other second, third option guard players, just in terms of pick and roll. They have him run a lot of pick and roll point guard actions lately, attacking closeouts, finishing or scoring in isolation, or just, you know, going to work and transition. He's really, really talented. But, but you look at his numbers with Booker and Durant on the court. 19 points per 75 on plus 7% efficiency. I like the efficiency part. I like the fact that he's shooting 39%. But Cody's taking under two free throws per 75 possessions. He's playing a very small third role when they're on the court. His offensive load is 32. Means he's about 32% of the time directly involved in the action. League, League average is like 27 or 28%. So... It's a small role. They've played 400 minutes together. They've had good success, which I like. They're plus 13. That makes me think like, okay, that's interesting. That's pretty good what you're doing. Then they go off the court and we get like old Bradley Beal. Um, (laughs) He's averaging like 30 points per 75 on league average efficiency. Takes nine free throws per 75 Mm -hmm. because he has the ball a lot and he's attacking. When he plays with only one of Booker and Durant, which has been most of his minutes, it's not, it's not, motivating it doesn't move me it's about 23 points per 75 on negative efficiency uh the teams haven't been great the sun's outcomes in those situations with he and booker are getting killed together when they're out there he and durant are basically dead even and you said it as an outside shooter it can be a mixed bag 33 to 36 percent in those lineups from downtown so i i don't know what to do with him if you make me choose i'm gonna say not a sub all-star this year okay yeah, good. Then I don't feel so bad leaving him off. But again, this is the guy that I need a little bit more data with, right? I need to see the Suns team really make it into the later rounds, and I need to see Bradley Beal in the playoffs again, because I know he's had success in the past, like when John Wall and Bradley Beal were, were making it into a couple of rounds in the playoffs. He looked good, right? I don't think Bradley Beal was getting cooked or anything in the playoffs, so, you know, maybe it's still there, and maybe I'll be eating my words in a few months. Let me give you another one who also has played quite poorly this season, but we have thought highly of in the past and is, you know, from a skill standpoint, you can make the argument that he should be in this group, Darius Garland of the Cleveland Cavaliers. When Darius Garland shares the court with Donovan Mitchell this season, 18 points per 75 plus 1% true shooting, 32% from three. I think his defense has issues it's really, really uninspiring. When he's out there alone, I think you get more of what you would see if he could run the ship. I mean, I just think he needs to have his own team, basically. He's 26 points per, 25 points per 75. His efficiency is around league average. His passing numbers go up. Uh, his free throw spike. His three-point shooting percentage goes up. The offensive rating isn't too much worse than when he's out there w- with the uh, red-hot Donovan Mitchell. So... To me, 
there's a horrible fit there, but also Garland is not, I, I want him to like slide next to a player player like that and succeed. And a, he just hasn't played well this season. B there's, there's injuries, there's poor playoff performances from last season. He, it's a similar thing to Beal. Like I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a very talented player and I'm not sure what to do. I'm very confused by this. I think we need, we need like a department to go and check out what's going on with the Cavaliers because none of it makes sense. Like if you told me that Mobley and Garland were to miss like 20 games and the Cavaliers would just be the best team in the league, I, I, I would laugh you out of here. I would. And I think a big theory for me for why Darius Garland, why I was so high on him in past seasons is I was like, this is Mark Price. This is 2023 Mark Price. This is 2024 Mark Price. But Mark Price would be able to coexist very well next right. to other high-end talent. And when I see Darius Garland isn't just thriving next to, like, Mitchell, it kind of blows my mind. I'm like, this is the theory of Darius Garland. And if Darius Garland, if, like, you say I'd like to see him on his own team, I don't know if he's good enough, like, right now to really run the ship of his own team and lead them to, like, a high-level office. I think, like, he needs to be the Mark Price to really kind of to add on to already a coexisting offense that's there already. So I'm not really sure. He looks nice. The passing still looks great. I think there's some weird turnover stuff that like I don't have a deep dive film study to go with here, but I don't know if he's being bothered by size a lot more. I don't know what it is. I have a lot of theories like that, but I don't have anything like hardcore to point at and be like, this is what's going on with Darius Garland. Shout out to uh, Mike Conley. You mentioned him earlier. He's like 46 years old playing good basketball in Minnesota. Shall we finish up with the wings? Can I shout out one guy that didn't make it, but I, I want to shout him out because he's been cooking? You're not allowed to do any more shout outs, okay? That's it. You're out. You've reached your quota of shout outs for I'm the gonna show. I'm going to speak out. I'm going to speak out this one. Ben, I've liked Kobe White. Kobe White has oh, looked nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He He's like really coming on. He's getting he very interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't know what to do with any of the Bulls. I was going to just save this whole Bulls segment. <laughs> Let's just start with the Bulls. We're okay. going to do wings. Let's start with the Bulls. Uh, we didn't talk about Nikola Vucevic. He's a pretty good basketball player, but we didn't talk. We didn't talk about him for a reason. Okay, <laughs> they have Kobe White at point guard. He did not make my sub All Star team. He's pl- he's playing very well lately. Um, they also have two wings that have traditionally either been in the All Star or sub All Star range: Zach Levine and Demar Derozan. This team is playing at five hundred. They are on pace to win about 40 or 41 NBA basketball games in 2024, where it's really hard to win games. And we shouldn't take stuff like that for granted. We should not take it for granted that the Cavs are like 35 and 16 without two of their young horses. But what do the Bulls have a sub all-star? What do I, I, I didn't know what to do. I started watching the Bulls. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with any of them. I did end up putting DeRozan down as a sub all-star. Like I did, I think, I don't know, they had such a slow start, and I think that really, like, you know, clogged up people's brains for how they were actually performing, but for a period of time, the Chicago Bulls have been, like, like you just pointed out, a very adequate team in a league where not every team is very adequate, right? Like, it's very easy to fall back into, like, oh, we're not quite doing as well as we can, but I don't know, what what is the record? Do they have a better record than the Lakers right now? Like, oh, they're very close. The Lakers might be better. I think the Bulls are one or two games under. 500 as of recording this and the Lakers I think are still over right something like that I so the, this is the okay. math of it that I just don't get this is the math I don't get this is my my Rockets take where I'm like if Van Vliet and Shangun are better on offense then their team should be better offensively and then the Bulls are kind of the other side where it's like I don't know man somebody has to be like a sub all-star level type of guy here I, I'm like can you be a 500 team without a top 50 player does that does the math work I think the answer is yes if you're Four other players are all top 80 players. Um, oh my God, I forgot another player who I might have struggled the most with, Alex Caruso. Mm. Alex Caruso is really good. Alex Caruso is in that Danny Green zone of like, you're so good as a strong role player, you're so perfect as a strong role player that the fact that you're a little better shooting, you're a little better attacking closeouts, you can pass, you're so good defensively. Does that total value package get you into the back end of the sub all star range? I don't know, but like this is the math to me is you can make a team like that pretty good, but what's their ceiling? DeRozan was the one who I might have come the closest to pulling the trigger on. I'm kind of out on DeRozan though. Mm. I kind of I kind of both love DeMar DeRozan and also like 
when your when your team is better than you every time you're on uh, when you're on the bench like like DeMar DeRozan's best play for the last 12 years has been bench that that's not great right wow. like if you don't know that if you haven't looked this up are you looking it up they are way better every year when he's on the bench than compared to on the court and then if you look at the playoff series it's almost even worse it's the exact same thing in the playoffs DeMar is one of those guys that you get to the postseason and his entire concept of like a mid-range assassin with low turnovers that can create in the middle of the floor, it kind of falls apart a little, Cody. The turnovers go up, the shooting falls apart. He actually is the lowest sort of high minute, high volume scorer in terms of efficiency in the last 25 years. There's just no one with that level of volume scoring doing it at that poor efficiency in the playoffs across stretches or his career. So I've had him, uh, I, I kept going back and forth on DeRozan because looking at his history, we've had him as a two-time sub all-star and a two-time all-star, including last season. And I was like, I know he was on the line last season, but I was like, well, if he's a little, he's a little slower this season, he's a little bit worse statistically, but he's still, he, man, he's still got some incredible mid range game and I think if we were only regular seasoning this concept, I would have him as a sub all star. But I think I'm going to go no. So you are basically going to have this Bulls 500 team with no sub all star. I, I, I had I had multiple players. I, Levine's all injured and weird. I don't know what to do with him. Uh, looking at my notes, Caruso is literally the closest purple. I have him in the very very last cut of the guards. And then DeRozan was also very close. And I don't think there's anyone else I could put in, but, but the math part, to your point, the math part, I think in the regular season alone, DeRozan is a, a top 50 player. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the Caruso math, I'm sorry, this is turning to a math equation. Like Ben and I are just sitting here with like a chalkboard. We haven't like done any numbers. We haven't done just yeah. because we say the word math doesn't mean we've done actual, <laughs> we haven't done any actual mathematics. Well, okay. So, Alex Caruso's load right now throughout the season is 22.5. Perfect. That is extraordinarily low. Like, my question with that, being in the 30th percentile, again, how much value offensively can you actually contribute when you have the ball that little? And, you know, his shooting has improved. I think he looks like a pretty viable shooter right now. He can't just leave him alone. But he's not Steph Curry. He's not bending defenses with his off-ball movement and like all this other kind of crazy stuff. So I don't think you can say he has a ton of latent value offensively. How much value can you actually have when you have that such that low of a load? Uh, you, I, not too much, I think, yeah. is the answer. Well, here's the thing. If you are a player like that, we saw this with Draymond Green. What you want to do when you're around better talent is find a way to amplify that talent. Find a way to be a piece in those lineups that doesn't cause the floor to fall out, right? Mm -hmm. Find a way to be a piece in that lineup that says, hey, if you're double teaming my guy, I'm going to make 40% of my open shots. Hey, if I need to make certain extra passes, I'm going to Robert Ori this thing through and through, right? I'm either going to hit this three, attack this closeout, or make a beautiful extra pass. And when you can be that element in those lineups, uh, next two great players... I think the answer is like Cody in other situations, you're not very good. You're not moving the needle offensively. But in those situations, if you can help those lineups keep the floor relatively high, then on the other end of the court, we get all your defensive value. That's where you're pretty good. I don't know if it's good enough to get Caruso there, though. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. Let's uh, let's talk about some wing all-stars. We're never going to get out of here. Ka <laughs> Kawhi Leonard... He could be the he could be the MVP. But there's like Devin, eight guys that could be the MVP right De now. Devin Booker, Paul George, Kevin Durant, LeBron James, Jason Tatum, Anthony Edwards, Jimmy Butler. I don't have to think too hard. All stars. Any anyone? Any complaints? Any thoughts? We good there? It's literally everyone I had. Okay. Uh, now we have a few more players left uh, to discuss, and then we can finish the podcast. It came up earlier, so I, I want to jump right to it. You thought I was going to ask you about Chris Middleton. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling about Chris Middleton? Um, Tell me if I'm biased. Let me let me float yeah, something out yeah, there. Yes, me... the, answer is, the answer is yes. You're biased when it comes to Chris Middleton. Yeah. <laughs> Chris Middleton, who I should say, I have as a two-time 
thinking basketball sub all star all star. I had him in two all star teams before he started to get old and injured. I think Mr. Christopher Middleton <laughs> might be the most underrated player in the NBA right now. Right now? Right now. Well, he's playing super well, which makes this all right, we're gonna have to we're gonna go into Cody's world here for a second. I think we have to. Here, let me let me play a game. Let me play a game. And it looks very different when you take Chris out of the lineup here. But in six hundred and fifty minutes, do you want to guess what the net rating of the Bucks are when Giannis, Dame, and Chris Middleton are on the court together? Who was coaching that team? Which of the three coaches was coaching <laughs> these players during these minutes? All of them. All of the minutes, Ben. Uh, uh, plus 16. Plus 17.9. So I, do ben, I, that's do... unbelievable. If you take yeah. Middleton out, if you look at like Dame lineups, if you look at Giannis lineups, if you look at Dame and Giannis lineups, it doesn't matter. They're nowhere near that. It's not like Chris Middleton is just riding the coattails here. I think Chris Middleton's passing game is incredibly undervalued. His mm-hmm. lobs to Giannis he just has it down like they have like the the Dennis Johnson Larry Bird connection where they just like psychically know what's going on and it probably helps that Giannis is one of the best lob finishers basically ever and one of the maybe the best rim finisher ever like that definitely helps but when you can like splice in the fact that Chris Middleton doesn't really rely on athleticism and can just kind of probe around before being like all right I'm gonna lean back and hit this little mid-range jumper he's hitting the three-point shot I, I don't know. As like a, a guy that can take the some of the bulk of like some pick and roll action, he can play on some weak side stuff. He can create out of that situation. I don't know, man. The defense is definitely not what it used to be like six years ago. Like he's probably, honestly, at this point, he might be a negative at this point. But offensively, I think he's pretty fantastic. The defense, yeah. The defense is the thing. He's He's had a really good offensive season very very quietly in our impact metrics he is above the 80th percentile in every impact stat uh, and most of that is coming from offense where he's even slightly better mid-range shooting this season he is in the 95th percentile in mid-range field goal percentage 53 percent from the mid-range on eight mid-range shots you know chris loves his mid-rangers and 41 percent on wide open threes in the last three seasons you add to that the passing is it has really been quite good this season from Chris Middleton. Um, my concern is the age and the wear and tear and what that means defensively in the playoffs because he is a little bit slower. I don't I don't know what's going on in Milwaukee. You mean you want to talk about math? What's going on in Milwaukee? The Bucs are like 37 and 16 with a point differential of plus one. They've had three different coaches. They've lost like six of their last seven games. They get blown out constantly in big moments, but we're going to say they have three all-star players. It's a it's extremely confusing. Um, it's because they're like plus 18 when they're all together. Giannis, how are they MV- pl- how are Giannis is in the MVP conversation. Hey, listen, how are they plus 18 when they're all together and their point differential is like this? What is it? Is It, it sounds like noise. It sounds like noise. Don't do it, this. It, it, <laughs> what, well, do you what? Do you think there's some alchemy taking place when the three of them are on the court that when you remove one? The entire house of cards falls apart. Is that what I you're actually saying? do. Because have you seen the rest of the wings oh, that Milwaukee true. has? Like they're not going to add anything off it. Like, mm. like Doc refuses to play. Like, yeah, never mind. This isn't a Bucks podcast. But yes. I do think there's an alchemy in terms of like the rest of the talent that's on the team. But also, I think that Giannis and Chris at this point have a really, really nice chemistry that's uh, pretty undervalued. This is where in the YouTube they're going to put the timestamp. One hour, 20 minutes, whatever it is, they're going to say, we missed Cody. We missed Cody right here. We got some vintage <laughs> Bucks Cody coming out. You know I, I'm speaking the truth, YouTube. You I, know it. I know. You're really moving me. You're really moving me on Chris Middleton right now. Um, you mentioned Desmond Bain. Mm-hmm. I'm going to stick I'm gonna stick with Desmond Bain as a sub-all-star. What is happening? <laughs> Wait, like, what do you mean? I agree with you, but have you like... I don't know, man. I guess the impact. Oh, oh because stuff is, he's struggling a little bit. Yeah, because he's struggling quite a bit. Yeah, it's one of those things that I'm not convinced that the first half of the Memphis season and the statistics that have been attached to Desmond Bain based on that season are reflective of him. You know, whatever that comes out to being like the 94th best player instead of the 48th best player or whatever. I'm not. I'm not convinced. Yeah, I have. A, I'm looking at a blend of of impact stats and he's 102nd in the league. I'm not convinced that that's representative of Desmond Bain as a player. So I'm going to just stick him on there. We don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. To me, Desmond Bain is like the definition of a sub all-star. Like when I think sub all-star, it's Desmond Bain. Yeah. 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 
how about somebody we just did some work on? He's been in this range before. I can't remember if I've ever put him on the sub all-star team, but he's he's finally he's won me over a little bit in New York. OG Ananobi, sub all-star. Okay, I don't know if it's because I just like work with you all the time, but why am I also valuing OG so much more than when he was with like the Toronto people are going to be like it's because he's in Canada and you hate us? No, it's I, because the Toronto people pushed him too hard on us. The Toronto people were like, OG's, OG's the defensive player of the year by a landslide, and he's a top 25 player. And I was like, I was like, now, wait a second. He's good. To, he's really good defensively. And also, like, he's a good player, but he's not, he's not a top 25 player. I think the difference is here, there's enough that's happened in New York in a different situation. In Toronto, there's like six guys built that are 6'6 with seven-foot wingspans that have the exact same skill set. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that if you take maybe the best of those guys as a as a connective tissue piece and you put them on another team, it's really easy to see how nice that fits into this sub-all-star kind of like good defender. It, it's, it's the Alex Caruso mold we just discussed, but like leveled up a little bit. Can I break the rules and say a couple guys that are in the same category? And I want you to tell me what you think about all of them. Because if you're granting OG Ananobi here, I want to know what you're thinking about Jaden McDaniels and Herb Jones. I think that OG is overall better than McDaniels. He's the closest. Uh, I don't think McDaniels... I don't know if I would say Jaden McDaniels is as good overall at everything. I think he's like a little bit worse at everything. Herb Jones is probably the farthest behind hmm. in that group. Yeah. These are guys I wrote down, Cody. These are okay. all guys I wrote down. But I'm going to go OG OG in the sub all-star team. Okay. Um, Franz Wagner. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about like a quintessential sub all-star. Not quite an all-star yet, but also like, I mean, to me, he's clearly the best magic player. Yeah. Yeah. Has any? By the way, maybe by the way, we should we shouldn't. It's not good podcast. The obvious. This is obvious. It's not good podcasting. Um, in the last month, in case people are wondering why we we got a little uh, uh, smitten right there. In the last month, Franz Wagner. Have you seen what he's been doing? No, but I imagine it's just wonderful things. Uh, he's in the top twenty-five in our BPM box plus minus model. He's averaging twenty-six points per seventy-five. On plus five percent efficiency, the passing has been better as ever. He's he's having these big games, scoring wise, taking over the game for the Magic. Orlando is plus eight per one hundred possessions with Franz Wagner on the court in the last month. Fifteen points better than when Franz goes to the bench. And just as a reminder, his teammate Paolo there in the negatives when he's on the court. So I just think Franz is Franz is getting there, man. Franz is getting there. Yeah, I think he's a really nasty little defender too like i don't think he's like oh, yeah. an all defensive type he's guy good. But he's he moves the needle a little bit defensively he does he definitely... move the needle quite a bit he uses his size his position his awareness so franz is going in there um we have a couple more to discuss and then we can wrap this very short brief podcast a couple more I'm, I'm just gonna say three names i'm gonna have them on my let me let me say four names oh my god say four names oh this is so brutal i'm gonna say four names aaron gordon Mm -hmm. Mikhail Bridges, Brandon Ingram, Jalen Williams. Oh my God! Would you like to discuss any of them? So okay. Would you just you said you said Aaron Gordon, Aaron said, Gordon, Mikhail Bridges, Brandon Ingram, Jalen Williams. I have three of those guys in my sub all star. I have three. I have three in my sub all star as well. Now the question is, I don't think we have the same three. I, I we need to have a discussion about. I personally need to have a discussion about one. Who do you have as sub all stars? Should I say the one I don't have a sub okay, all star? Let's just agree Jalen Williams is just easy. That's yeah, a, absolutely. He's a, yeah. he's a slam dunk. That dude is a baller. He's incredible. He's incredible. We, yeah. Okay, let's do it that way. I say the next easy one. Can we just say that Brandon Ingram? Brandon is also Ingram just is the next easy one. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Brandon Ingram vacillates between why can't you be an all star and what's going on with you? That puts yeah. him right square. He's a perfect sub all star, that Brandon yeah. Ingram. It's, this is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I have questions. I have so many questions coming up now. What's happening? Uh, I have questions about a certain player that plays in Brooklyn. <sighs> yeah. I, I, I have Mikhail Bridges and Aaron Gordon, and I have them right next to each other, and I, I need to talk about it. Okay. My dog agrees, if you, <laughs> if you can hear her. 
<laughs> Who would you like to start with, Mikhail? Let's talk about Mikhail Bridges. Let's do it. Let's I, do I it. think I think he's a swell defender. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I think he's a swell perimeter defender. <laughs> And All right. uh, All I, right. I, I like I like when he does three-point shots, and I like when he attacks closeouts. Yep. He is a similar mold of the other players we have discussed that like like an OG and an Obi. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I don't think he's good defensively. I don't think he's quite as good defensively, yeah. Um, here's Okay, here's the thing. Mikael Bridges is a player, like cards on the table. I don't know if it was last year. I don't know if it was two years ago. But I think I tweeted that if I were to have a team, I want Mikael Bridges on my team. Mm-hmm. Right. He's kind of a perfect sort of jackknife sort of dude. Mm-hmm. But like like sort of like Jaron Jackson being thrust into his new role or even Drew Holiday being like reduced so much. Mikhail is just so wildly miscast in what he's doing in Brooklyn right now. Like I I, I just don't know. Like I'm losing. I don't know. I the, want the to vision. See him. The like, vision is the vision is fading is what you're yeah, saying. The, vi- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the vision is fading. Yeah. Here's the other thing. Okay, sorry, I'm getting like numbers here. I'm getting worked up. I'm getting emotional. It was like that one time, I don't know who we were talking about, but I got choked up talking about him. Um that was a magical moment. And I'm just kind of vamping right now to look up some numbers here. But when you talk <laughs> about like the math uh, this is the of best part of, of the guys, podcast. When, when you talk about <laughs> the math. Amazing. Can you explain to me? With their personnel, how Brooklyn has a worse than average defense? Like, can can somebody like walk me through? Can somebody make a PowerPoint presentation and tell me how Brooklyn's defense is worse than league average? Tell me, anybody, anybody, who plays on Brooklyn? Mikael Bridges. Yeah. Nick Nick Claxton. Nick Claxton. Who else? Yeah. Um, Does Darren Dorian Sharp? Finney Smith? Dorian Finney Smith. Okay. Yeah. Who There's else? Some Really solid defensive who players. Else? Who's that, who else is on that team? Who knows? Cam Thomas. Cam Tom, but Cam Thomas is sending the defense no. directly in the other direction. <laughs> Spencer Dinwiddie's not on the team Spencer anymore. Spencer Dinwiddie, is, it's, it's not helping your case. Daron Sharp plays minutes. Cam Johnson. Cam Johnson. Uh, Lonnie Walker sending it in the other direction. Dennis Smith Jr. It's, it's, it's a mixed bag. Den- they don't- Have you watched Dennis Smith Jr. play defense? You he think he's the an best. elite defender? He might be the best defender on the team. <laughs> he's unreal. He's so frisky out there. I'm oh, also a big Nick Claxton happening? lover. It's just I don't know. This team should be better. They should be like a plus three defensive team in a box. What, what is happening? This is amazing. This um, is amazing right now. I have a I have questions about Aaron Gordon for you, Cody. Okay. What would Aaron Gordon be without Nikola Jokic? That's a great question. Don't we have a lot of years of evidence? Yeah, well, like the last two years, for instance. Aaron Gordon, first of all, he plays a lot of his minutes with Jokic. Uh, Cody's Cody's mentioned this before on prior podcasts, like the percentage of minutes that duos play together. Gordon has played about 83% of his minutes in the last two years with Nikola Jokic. So he's 18 points, 62% true shooting with Jokic. Without Jokic, he's 19 points, 54% true shooting. And interestingly, his three-point shooting percentage has been way, way better in the 500 minutes without Jokic. So if you if you factored in the three-point shooting luck, if you normalized the three-point shooting and said, Aaron, you have to shoot the same on threes as when the best passer ever is on the court with you or when you're out there by yourself, he would be like 50%. I mean, I, mean, I would have to do it off the top of my head, but it's bad. It, he would lose a lot more on those scoring numbers. He's a nice extra passer. I quite like that. He's a nice defender. Is he as good defensively as OG Ananobi? No. Um, he has nice feel for reading the game, setting screens, uh, getting inside seals so he can catch lobs. He, I give him a ton of credit because of the passing and learning to play in that Denver style and being such a great piece in that Denver style. And so I think all of this to say, Cody, that if we just took it at face value, Aaron Gordon in in Denver in the regular season, I think he's a sub all-star. But what if you put him on any of the other 29 teams? Also, what has been happening with my hair as we go through this episode? Have you seen this? <laughs> Sorry, I actually don't like watch your hair. The whole, maybe I should. Maybe we should it's be going, a hair it's, watch. It's gotten in my face. It's going, it's, oh my goodness. Let me, let me, can I take you in the time machine? Just like 15, 16 years. 16 Is it years. a DeLorean? Let's, you know, whatever gets us back to like 2007, it's the safest, right? Let's okay. say it's 2007. All right, that's a hot tub, I think. 2007. Okay. Uh, 2000. That might actually be when when the hot tub 
came out. Um, 2007. Would you say Sean Marion is an all-star? Yeah, I would. Yeah. Yeah. If Sean yeah. Marion was not next to Steve Nash, would you say that Sean Marion is an all-star? I feel like wasn't wasn't he really he was really good defensively like when he, he was, was in Dallas if you he was older in Dallas but if you took a younger better version of that in Dallas yeah I think he'd be an all star too oh okay wow. you don't notice what's happening with my hair this is just <laughs> wild I can't figure out what's going on where who do we have left to discuss I'm still like reeling on this <laughs> this Nets thing I was trying to pull up some numbers right now. <laughs> So oh, just just oh. for fun, <laughs> okay. I have two more two more to discuss. You, go ahead. Just for fun, when uh, Claxton, Mikael Bridges, and Dorian Finney-Smith are on the court together, their defensive rating is like one twelve point seven. And actually, if we look at league average defense, that's like five points better. Maybe maybe I should relax a little bit. Maybe yeah. they're actually pretty solid when they're together. Calm down. Give them okay. give them a little positivity. Slow your roll. Okay. Scott, <laughs> Scotty Barnes made the All Star team. And Jalen Brown made the all-star team. Uh, in the past, I have had Jalen Brown as a sub-all-star for three years. I put him on the 2022 all-star team, the year the Celtics went to the finals. Hmm. I had him as a sub-all-star. Sorry, I got that backwards. Sub-all-star 2022, all-star last year. I'm going back to sub-all-star with Jalen Brown, I've had enough of Jalen Brown as, a, as an All Star. No, I, he's in the he's in the purple zone. I don't know what to do. I'm going to go on the other side of the line, and I'll do the same thing with Scotty Barnes. I'll have Scotty Barnes as a sub All Star in the purple zone as well. What do you make of Barnes's impact stuff? What's happening with his impact? Is it good? No. No, it's, it's actually it's like terrible. shockingly. It's shockingly no, bad. No, but, it, but it's 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 divisive because like EPM still likes him. So the EPM's baking in more like tracking, tracking box score stuff and saying like, yeah, maybe we think the on off numbers that are bleeding value in Toronto are fluky or are noise based. The, we talked about this already, so I don't want to belabor it. I think the thing with Barnes is he's not really an offensive initiator, but he gives you some of that. He's a good passer, not a great scorer. So there's a lot of like extra little offensive value that you could parse out there. But if you give him a bigger role, what does that look like? Does it make it look better than it is? And then defensively, he's very good and very versatile, but uh, probably not at a place where like just his defense alone. Like if, if he came back next season and he was a monster defensively, I think that elevates him quite a bit into the, into the top players category, basically. I would say based strictly on the eye test, I really like Scotty Barnes. I think he does, you know, the defense isn't perfect, but I think he's really switchable. He's got a really high motor. He's active all over the place. And the passing game, offensively, if you go to that side of the ball, um, he's a nice secondary passer. Like you said, you don't want him to be like the main primary type of guy. But I think if you slide him next to their high-end offensive talent, I think he does, he would do well in that sort of situation. So it's like a... Oh, what, what is it that you and Kyle are bringing up? The old two O or O two? What what's the yeah O one O one D one? Where do you where do you stack up as a sort of offensive and defensive player on a good team? That yeah. kind of thing. I yeah. think he could be like a really solid O two or even like as an O three. I really like what he'd be able to do as like a connective um, offensive guy. So I, I like Barnes as a sub all star. Okay, are we doing? Are we summarizing this at this point? We're gonna wrap this up and summarize. We have to make some choices. I thought we made choices. We did. We did make choices. But we at the end, we always review. We say, like, in the big man category, we had Nikola Jokic, Joel Embiid, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Anthony Davis, Bam Adebayo, Chet Holmgren, Victor Wembanyama, Chris Depps Porzingis, and Lowry Markkinen as the All-Stars, right? Yeah, that sounds good. Oh, okay. And then in the sub-All-Stars, we had Carl Anthony Towns, Draymond Green, Rudy Gobert, Pascal Siakam, Demonis Sabonis, Zion Williamson, Alpern Schengen, Jarrett Allen and Jaron Jackson Jr. Am I forgetting anyone? Nope. Okay. Uh, in the guards for All Stars, we have Shea Gildas Alexander, Tyrese Halliburton, Luka Doncic, Donovan Mitchell, James Harden, Jalen Brunson, Tyrese Maxey, Dame Lillard, Jamal Murray, Steph Curry, Trey Young, De'Aaron Fox. And that is it for the All Star guards. For the sub All Stars, we have Kyrie Irving, Derek White, CJ McCollum. Drew Holiday, LaMelo Ball, 
And then we had this decision to make, right, with Fred Van Vliet and Colin Sexton. Uh, I will go. I will go out on both of them. Okay. I will go. That's it. Those are all my All Star guards. That's I it. I accept that. Okay. And then the wings. Finally, Kawhi Leonard, Devin Booker, Paul George, Kevin Durant, LeBron James, Jason Tatum, Anthony Edwards, and Jimmy Butler are the All Star wings. And the sub All Star wings: Jalen Brown, Scotty Barnes, Jalen Williams, Brandon Ingram, Mikael Bridges. Franz Wagner, OG Ananobi, Desmond Bain. Did we say Bridges was in? I don't know what we said actually. We kind of, <sighs> I kind of blacked out for a while there. Yeah, I think I got. I think I have to go Bridges in. Okay. It's really interesting though to like take that archetype and think about it with an OG Ananobi and like compare them as players because I feel like OG moves the needle more defensively. Can I say I I. I think Herb Jones is being slept on a little bit here. As a sub all star. I I think he should be considered a little bit more. Wow. Heavy. Wow. Okay. I think Caruso is the better version of Herb Jones. How about that? Interesting. Yeah. They're very think? Di- I think they're very different archetypes. Really? I do. They defend a lot of positions. I think Caruso is a much better passer. I think Caruso I think is Jones a better is, passer. Is Herb Jones a better shooter? I don't think Herb Jones is a better shooter than Alex Caruso. No. You mean if you're just looking at like outside outside shooting? Alex Caruso, so. three-year wide open three-point shooting, 38%. Oh, wow. That's good. From downtown, 51% from the mid-range. Herb Jones, 34% from downtown, 27% from the mid-range. That's, so where, no. I lose, that's where I lose it with Herb. I just think he's a worse version of, of that. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. How did it feel? How did it feel to come back and do... Is there any other names you want to mention? Do you just want to yell Jalen Johnson into the airwaves or something? I do. Love Denny him. Avdia, does that need, make you feel oh, good or something? I do love some Denny Avdia. Yeah. Walker Kessler with more minutes would definitely be in consideration, but he's just not there. I, I really, I think we talked about Nick Claxton last year, but the Nets are just weird to me. Yep. Yeah, uh, you you know what's weird? Yusuf Nurkic has like really good regular season stats. I just don't trust it. Isn't that isn't that wild? Yeah, I think yeah. I, I feel it. Who are we also? We Dyson Daniels has got injured today. That's sad. Dyson Daniels, why why do you have to bring that up? He rules. Yeah. How close? I know. Wait, how close is Jalen Suggs? I was going to ask you if you had Jalen Suggs <laughs> as an All Star. I was going to ask you right now. Yeah, I, I don't, and I don't think he's really like. That, I had Jalen. I had Jalen Suggs in the category of like, you're 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 very close to me being able to talk about you in the sub All Star podcast. That was the category I have him in. I yeah. think if I were to rank the players that are not sub All Star level that I'd want on my team, Jalen Suggs is number one. Yeah, yeah, he's in that next tier. Of, yeah, yeah. everyone we didn't talk about today, and then there's Jalen Suggs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to support us, patreoncom slash thinking basketball i think that's the website i've lost all oxygen in my brain at this point after we went through 67 nba players in the last 90 minutes uh, i felt like we deep dived all of them what do you do at page patreon.com slash thinking basketball that's where you get the stats and we got the playoff series stats we have the regular season stats we have team stats we have all kinds of things um that you can look up that we use to research podcasts and videos and things like that Cody, you you made it, man. How did it first first podcast as a dad? Yeah, and here now I'm starting to think like, man, Isaiah Hartenstein is is an interesting <laughs> player too. He's really fun to like. That Knicks team is just is is really really fun to watch. They just have so much heart. Jalen Brunson started crying after a regular season win, and I've never fell in love with a player like quicker. Like I I loved Jalen Brunson, but like that dude, it, it's I hate the like he's got that dog in him. But like when I was watching that, I'm like, this dude's got that dog in him. Like this is incredible. It's the only time I've ever thought that about the player ever, and I like meant it seriously in my head. Uh that's it. That was a fun time. <laughs> I I appreciate it. it. Was good. It was good to have you back. I appreciated doing this. Thanks for. Uh, I mean, hopefully, you'll come back and do a few more before the All Star. I mean the all the All Star. <laughs> We're at the All Star. Um, the playoffs and the only thing i was going to say is that if you asked me in the playoffs i think we'd have a completely different team yeah i think you're probably right yeah i'm, st- I'm stressing about the thinkies already that's that's getting in my head cannot wait for that um <laughs> hope you enjoyed this one thanks for listening all the way through and of course hope you're having a great day